It is Global PMI Day, and you know what that means. In addition to S&P Global's PMIs, we're going to have to get an update from Steve Van Meter and his Disney Park Attendance Water Park PMI 2. We've got them all covered today. We've got the United States, we've got Europe, we've got Germany, we've got Japan, and contrary to maybe what most people say, they don't look very good. In fact, we're, we're seeing more evidence of exactly what we've been talking about all along. The global economy last year got really weak, and then disinflation happened. And disinflation created a temporary rebound where economies from the United States to Europe and everywhere in between had a little bit of a, a resurrection, not quite a recovery, but it seemed as if maybe we interrupted the recessionary trend, but then summertime hit, and this is where the Disney Park attendance PMI comes in, and we have rolled over, and now we're heading back lower again. Destination so far unknown. According to Jay Powell and the FOMC in their latest meeting, the destination is the same soft landing. They don't care how we get there. They just know that's where we're going. Where the data and mostly the internals, especially the internals, suggest Okay, it might be a soft landing at first, but sometimes the soft landing continue to land and you continue to go right on through into the ground, so to speak. So, Steve, where do you want to begin today? We've got all of these all this PMI data. We've got your own PMI data, which has been incredibly useful because it's now being corroborated by other uh, economic accounts and statistics. Where do you want to start? You know, Jeff, I like, let's start with the overview and let's kind of go around the world and into Typhoon Lagoon because I do have a major update on this. It's oh. very, very interesting. But I, I want to talk about this mythical soft land because, you know, I want everyone to understand that throughout history of here, it doesn't happen. There's, there's no evidence. There's no cases. There's no pillow that gets under the economy. It's not comfortable. Now, there may be a point where we say, oh, it feels like a soft landing. And then the next month is clearly, oh, no, there was nothing there. So I want everyone to understand that the notion that the Fed is going to engineer the impossible is only a fantasy propagated by central bankers. Because if everything we were supposed to be seeing was or being told was true, then Jeff, what, I'm, what you're going to tell us in the reports here is the services sector around the world should be expanding and that the manufacturing sector should be dragging behind it because that's the story we've been given. So tell me, is that true? No, I, you know that, Steve. It's not true. It's never true. It's The services sector is getting weaker and weaker because, as you have said repeatedly here on this show, manufacturing tends to lead. If we see weakness in manufacturing and everybody says, oh, who cares? It's the manufacturing. Well, that usually is a warning sign that, that the, the situation is going the wrong direction. And as you pointed out, soft landings don't happen. If you're talking about a soft landing, you've already lost. Because if it's even a question, then we've already gone too far. And I, I mentioned on a previous show, Alan Blinder, the famous economist, or at least the most well, one of the most well-known academic economists, he wrote a paper not long ago where he had to change the definition of soft landing just to fit the Fed into one. Because even he said, well, you know, we don't really see soft landings anywhere in the statistics or in the real economy. History is not kind. It's almost like the zero lower bound. If you're actually talking about it, it's already too late. But the question here, Steve, is, and you know this is the big problem, it's time. We've been talking about recession. People have been talking about soft landing for quite a lot of time. And according to most people, outside of Europe anyway, we don't see the recession. Therefore, it must not happen. I mean, the longer it goes where we don't have confirmation from the MBER, that means it's not coming, right? Absolutely. And I love this that you said he rewrote the definition because isn't that this is like a total central banker thing. Hey, our inflation target. Oh, wait, we, we, uh, we, that, that, that actually happened. Well, we're just going to readjust it. So we can't get a soft landing. So let's just rewrite the definition here. Uh, it, it's just, it, I hate to laugh, Jeff, but it's so funny that it's ridiculous because it's true all the time here. Uh, but yes, as we take a look here, what's going on in Europe now. You know, we've kind of suggested that this would be a good case study for what's coming for the rest of the world. And sure enough, the manufacturing sector, and again, you just want people to think about this. If, if there's fewer new orders, then of course the manufacturing sector is going to slow. And then eventually you're going to work through the backlogs and that's going to outflow to the services sector. It doesn't go the other way around. It just doesn't happen that way. And Jeff, you got some new data here uh, today from preliminary data. I know S&P Global hit us with it. 
Yeah, the, the word that you that came up a lot, it's a word that we've been talking about the last couple of months. First, it was new orders. Remember, we talked about new orders contracting. That's the first sign. And then the more important one is backlogs. And backlog is going to be repeated several times in all these jurisdictions. And that's not a good thing either. So let, let's start with Europe. You brought up Europe. Europe is, in my opinion, already in recession. The GDP doesn't necessarily sync, uh, sync up with that, but GDP... Uh, Europe is in recession, and it looks like rather than skip out of it, they're going further into one. And the S&P Global data for, for the month of September, the preliminary estimates suggest exactly that. Manufacturing fell a little bit, 43.4 compared to 43.5 in August. Uh, services, 48.4. That's up a little bit from 47.9. But as you know, Steve, the, the 47.9 and 48.4 are not, there's no difference there. The composite, 47.1 which is up four tenths from 46.7. But the, the comments, you got to love some of these comments because S&P Global does not like writing negative things. And it show, it stands out in a lot, of, a lot of cases. Whenever they have to write negative, they always pepper it with what, what they think might be sound positive, but really isn't positive. Here's what they said about Europe. The Eurozone private sector remained in contraction at the end of the third quarter of the year as waning demand led to a further decline in activity. The overall reduction in output was again led by manufacturing, but the service sector saw activity decrease for the second month running. Although firms continue to expand their staffing levels, this is something we got to talk about, the rate of job creation was only marginal amid evidence of spare capacity and the gloomiest outlook since the final quarter of last year. So we went through the downturn, the, the dead cat bounces we talked about, I think, last week, and now we're back into, uh-oh, the bounce is over. But Jeff, that sounds like last month because they're saying this, almost the same thing of like, oh, wait, this is this has got to be the bottom. It can't get any worse. But that's the problem here is it is going to get worse. And I know a lot of people, you because we can we, we can do charts of the PMIs. I know you do that for your subscribers. And you can say, hey, look, these are at levels what we previously seen bottom. And that gets people excited because there's this whole thing about, well, it can't get worse. And then it does. And the problem, the way it gets worse, and I want everyone to understand, because you mentioned, Jeff, you know, the employment number there is when you see new orders go down, that just means you're going to take your, your workers and you're going to say, hey, go work on some of these backlogs. Now, the problem is if you work your backlogs way down and you don't get more new orders, then what do you have? a bunch of idle workers. And so management then looks at the situation and says, wait a minute, you know, the central bankers are saying soft landing, the politicians are saying that the economy is going to grow. So we'll hang on for a month or two or three. And the next thing you know, they have to lay off. And it's surprising that we haven't seen this in Germany yet. We have seen it in Germany. Yes, that's, that's where we're going next. That's Europe as a whole hasn't gotten to the layoff part, but at least according to S&P Global's data, and you and I were talking before we started, it's already maybe has hit UK, which we won't get into here. But let's talk about Germany, because Germany used the two words that we're looking for, and that's backlogs and employment. And you don't want those two words together. You can talk about employment and you can talk about backlogs separately, but you don't want backlogs and employment together because that's the recession stuff that most people associate with recession. So manufacturing in Germany was under 40 for the third consecutive month. 39.2, that's just horrible. Services, 49.8, that rose a bit from 47.3 in August. The composite was 46.2, up from 44.6, but again, there's no difference there. And the comment, the weaker demand environment saw average output prices rise at the slowest rate for over two and a half years, despite an intensification of cost pressures. That's not a good sign. Employment, meanwhile, fell for the first time since December 2020, albeit only slightly, they have to throw in there as businesses reported shrinking backlogs of work and pessimistic expectations for activity in the year ahead. So Germany, Europe, recession, then a little bit of a bounce, and then we're back into even worse recession heading toward the, the end of this year. And that's a particular challenge because we're seeing reports that holiday spending is going to decline. And so you start to think about the manufacturing sector, why it's so important is if, if new orders are coming down then that tells us 
Backlogs are gone. Employment is next. It's unfortunately, it's inevitable. There's no way these companies can just sit on, you know, idle employees for too long. They will have to cut. And then when those people get cut, they go on the employment, unemployment line. Well, their income drops. And I want everyone to understand that when their income drops, well, that means their spending is less. And you start to build a, it, it starts as slowly. And I know you believe this, Jeff, and then it accelerates because a few people on the unemployment line, that's okay. Too many? Boom, demand is gone, factories dragging services sector down. And now we get over to the baby. You said we're not talking about the UK, but that's the first place now we've seen in the data where we've seen layoffs start to show up. Yeah, that's. I think that's the one part that most people focus on when they talk about the soft landing. They say, okay, I hear what you're saying. Manufacturing in particular is weakness. Services, questionable. Yeah, I get the weakness. Okay, we understand that. But where are the layoffs? What's going on with the employment market? And it's I think one of the things that we, you know, we've talked about this all year is that this cycle is is weird. It's different. It's elongated in a way that we haven't seen before. But that doesn't change the underlying economics, small e economics that, as you just laid out, Steve, unless something actually picks up. I mean, businesses, they don't want to lay off workers, but they're not charities. They're not going to sit on their profits and lose profits forever. They're waiting to see if this does play out in the way Jay Powell said. But the longer it goes, that doesn't mean it's not going to happen. That means the longer it goes where we don't get a turnaround means it's more likely that we're going to see what we're actually seeing in Germany, in the UK and other places. Businesses are going to have to cut, um, not just in terms of workers, but also their investments, their spending and a whole bunch of others. They're going to start controlling their costs even more which is compounded by the the the, re, the resurrection and rise in oil prices, which is really badly timed here because we've got a weak economy to begin with. And the last thing we can afford is now higher oil prices. Yeah. I mean, so you look at these companies, right? These kind of infinite pots of money that central bankers think. It's like, oh, just give them more raises. I mean, it's like they, they don't they don't have a ton of money because these companies are getting squeezed by inflation, too. And so we can look historically at times during inflate where you see high inflation and then you see it come down as we're seeing now, we know the profits come down. And so there's only a matter of time before these companies get squeezed. They need to see new orders come back. I don't think we're going to see it. And like you just said, Jack, the, the energy sector, huge problem here because everyone's like, all right, well, you know, sometimes crude oil and we, we've talked about this before. Sometimes it tells us the global economy is growing. So we'd have to look and say, hey, look, I don't know what's wrong with the rest of the economy, but oil's really got it right. But it doesn't always work that way. And so what we're seeing now is these higher energy costs are going to bite into what little discretionary spend or money people have. And again, it's all just being shown up in the factory sector. People don't have the money to spend. Oil, like you said, worst possible thing the global economy could see right now is rising oil prices. Yeah, if it was demand, that'd be one thing. But we all know oil is rising because the Saudis are getting their way and working with the Russians and squeezing oil higher, which is just causing enormous pain. But there's, there's one quote here from S&P Global. They said, substantial decrease in backlogs. Can you guess what they were referring to? Was that Germany? Was that Japan? Who were they talking about when they talked about substantial decrease in backlogs, Steve? Ooh, Jeff, this is a tough one because I didn't read the reports and you know this. I'm going to go with the U.S. Yeah, surprising to some, the U.S. numbers, the numbers themselves are getting a little bit worse. They're, they're, they're not really great, but it's the, again, the underlying internals that suggest we're turning the wrong corner here. So by the numbers, manufacturing actually improved by a point to 48.9 from 47.9, but that's, it was 49 in July. So that's three straight months where we're dipped back under 50. Services fell to an eight month low of 50.2, which is services should be around 53. That's really downturn territory. 50.2, we're got recession stuff already. That's down from 50.5 in August. The U.S. composite for September, 50.1 right there. So down one-tenth of a point from 50.2 in August. And it was 52 in July. So again, downward trend. However, S&P Global also notes new orders fell at the strongest pace this year so far as demand for services slipped further into contractionary territory. Uh-oh. Manufacturers also saw a drop in new sales. No surprise, albeit at a slightly softer pace. Got to put his positive spin on it. But here's the big one. 
Pressure on capacity continued to wane as backlogs of work were depleted at a steep pace. That's the uh uh-oh. The rate of decline gained further momentum with outstanding business falling at the sharpest rate since May 2020. Not good there. Efforts to sustain output through work on incomplete orders led to a substantial decrease in backlogs. As firms noted, lower new order inflows led to increased spare capacity. And that last one, Steve, as you know, increased spare capacity, falling orders, working through backlogs. What is that? Spare capacity is... Disinflationary. The deflation. It's where it's not disinflation. It's deflation. Well, well, come on, Jeff. We're not we're not at the central bankers' target yet. But I have a I have a hunch. This is my prediction that we're. I think we're going to just blast right through it to the downside. But yes, this is all is all telling us deflation is coming. But you know, Powell. I think what did they say? What did he say that we're not going to get down to target until twenty twenty six? That's, I mean, what that's the a long ways away. Like, it's like okay, what are you guys <laughs> doing with these rate hikes then? Right. Well, that's the thing. They can't predict next month what they write. We can't tell you what we're going to do next month, but two years from now or three, we're for sure we're going to get to our target. I don't get it. Yeah. So let's finish this up here. Our PMI roundup. We could let me quickly go through Japan because it's it's noteworthy because Japan was one of those economies that everybody thought was escaping the global malaise. It started out this year, GDP looked good, and uh, some of the other internals looked good. Wages seem to be rising. The CPIs are hot, which people wrongly associate with economic activity. And so Japan looked like it was going to take off. They even talked about the Bank of Japan raising rates. But just like the rest of the economy, you had that false start, that dead cat bounce at the start of the year. And now we're rolling back down. According to S&P Global, or actually I think it's Jaiboon Bank, manufacturing for Japan 48.6 down from 48.9 services 53.3 down from full 54.3 again it's it's the trend not necessarily the numbers the composite 51.8 down from 52.6 and the comments were just like everybody else basically things are not looking so good there so Steve let's finish it up with the Disney park attendance PMI trademark Yes, Jeff. So definitely attendance is down. Uh, for l- last night, I was at uh, Epcot, for example, with a friend of mine. And, you know, we talked about, hey, should we go to one of the sit down restaurants and get dinner? Well, nice thing is you can pull up an app and you can see. And usually the answer is no, maybe unless you wait till like nine o'clock at night. And it was like, oh, wow, there's like seven restaurants that we could get in right then and there. Highly unusual. Now we over at Typhoon Lagoon following Labor Day weekend, which was a busy weekend at the park. It has gotten so bad that in the last hour and a half of the opening or the park is open, Stafford literally, there's just no work. The bartenders, nobody's ordering, no one's buying, no one's there. It's crazy. The the staff is telling me we have never seen this sharp of a drop off following Labor Day. They're optimistic. Now they're kind of like central bankers a little bit, that it's going to get better. I said, look, if this is a sign of where it's now, what makes you think it's going to get better? They're telling me seasonal effect. I said, no, this is a sign we're out of money. And one of my buddies, one of the bartenders, you're going to love this. He was just traveling uh, somewhere over uh, out down to Mexico. He said, Steve, when I used to get to the airports in the morning, I went to MCO. He goes, you used to have to get there early because there was a line. Last time, he said the pre-check line was longer than just a normal walkthrough line. He's like, I walked right through that. And then when I was coming home, he said there was no lines at that airport. He says, all of a sudden, something changed. I said, there you go, my friend. That is the indicator. The money's gone. And the PMIs are just telling us that's happening. If you want to see more about Steve's water park, Disney attendance, PMI, or whatever we call that thing, check out the video at the link below me. As always, I thank you for joining me. Thank you, Mr. Stephen Van Meter. Until next time, take care.